Thanks everyone for joining today. My name is Errol Yabake. I'm a senior fellow and deputy director at the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington, DC. Um, I really appreciate you, you joining today. This is gonna be a very, very interesting conversation that uh, unlike some of CSIS's other conversations really um, draws on a lot of expertise um, directly from places that are outside Washington, DC. So we're, we're hoping that you get a lot out of today's conversation. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, that we're, we're here um, in partnership with the Royal Embassy of Denmark. We're very grateful to the, to the um, partnership that we have had for several years uh, with the embassy and, and look forward to continuing to do good work. We, um, just published a, a document called Drivers of Recovery, Elevating the Youth Peace and Security Agenda that um, we, we hope everyone will have a chance to read. It's linked, um, I guess, below uh, on, on this page. And um, in it, we talk about how estimates place uh, the number of youth around the world at, at 1.2 billion, half of which half of whom live in developing countries and many of those live in conflict affected areas. Um, and so while that is normally seen as a, as a challenge, and I think in many ways that it is, especially during COVID, and we'll talk about some of those challenges here today, uh, it's also an opportunity. And, and it's an opportunity to, to build back better post COVID. Um, and I use those words deliberately because uh, I think the Biden-Harris administration has a, has a big opportunity um, to, to really reinvigorate this youth peace and security agenda and, and take it to the next level. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this brief, Elena uh, Mendez-Leal, uh, intern extraordinaire, uh, Chris Metzger, a, a former research associate of our program and current Georgetown master student, and uh, my colleague Yanina Shtagun, um, who is with us on the Project for Prosperity team. Um, that's enough for me. Uh, I would love to introduce um, uh, Ambassador Lona Visberg. Uh, she is the ambassador of Denmark to the United States. She's the former COO of the entire Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs and uh, ambassador to Spain. And I won't ask her which one was cooler, being ambassador to Spain or, or ambassador to the US. Um, I, she has a 25-year incredible career in the Danish Foreign Service, and, and I consider her many people consider her to be uh, a pioneer um, in, in the Danish Foreign Service. I also read that, uh, Ambassador, you have a teenage son, so perhaps this, uh, this topic is a little bit personal uh, to you. I, I won't ask you to, to comment or incorporate him in any way, but um, you know, it's, uh, as, as someone with kids who are a little bit too young to be considered youth, um, it's it's will be great to hear from you. So thank you again for your partnership and over to you. Thank you very much, Earl. That's right, I have a 17 year, year old son. So this topic is very much on, on my mind uh, and uh, I don't wanna compare Spain to the US either, but I would say that, uh, you know, this posting in Washington is just a jewel in the crown, couldn't be otherwise. So, <laughs> so with this again, thank you, Earl and to CSIS for setting up this event. Uh, we are really happy to be collaborating with you on this important topic. And it's an honor for me to be here uh, with such a great panel. Uh, I look very much forward to the uh, conversation. Now, last year, uh, the world celebrated the fifth uh, anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 2250 on youth uh, peace and security. That was a resolution which really uh, cemented that young people are key in realizing peace and security uh, from the local to the global uh, level. Uh, and it was a milestone, I think, in our efforts uh, towards achieving sustainable peace. Since 2015, the agenda for uh, increased youth inclusion has gained momentum, often because of young people's own actions and, uh, and demands. Um, young people are now increasingly recognized as peace builders and as agents of change in preventing, mitigating and resolving conflict in, in their communities. And we have seen uh, lately tens of thousands of young people carrying out peaceful climate action actions, alerting the older generation uh, of, the, uh, of the negative consequences of climate change. 
And we've seen thousands of young people uh, taken to the streets in, in, in Lebanon, in Iraq and Sudan to peacefully protest against bad governance and, and sectarianism and in favor of inclusiveness and, uh, and peace. But although we've come a long way in five years, there's still a long way to go. Uh, and while youth have the right to participate and to be heard in matters regarding their own lives, they continue to count, encounter both structural barriers and limitations to their participation in peace and security efforts. Now, last year, 2020, was an unusual year for us all. Um, but we also saw the pandemic especially uh, exacerbated challenges to young people globally, uh, including in fragile contexts. It has, however, also highlighted the positive role that youth play in their communities as agents for change. Uh, and in this time of crisis, young people around the world have shown action. They've been a source of hope and inspiration in our fight against uh, a common threat both through innovative approaches to disease prevention and control, but also through countering misinformation, both online and, and offline. They've shown that young people are uh, not to be regarded merely as peripheral stakeholders, but as equal partners for peace. Accordingly, uh, as you at as CSIS emphasized in your recent work that you mentioned, young people have the potential to be drivers of economic growth of increased prosperity and of political and social change. I'm therefore proud that Denmark is one of the pioneering countries to mainstream youth into our work uh, globally. We work actively internationally advocating for YPS to be both included and implemented in multilateral fora such as uh, the UN and, and the EU. And we have developed toolkits to address YPS in our work and we have a strong focus on supporting youth-led work throughout our collective efforts. But most importantly, we also work locally. We are engaging youth uh, directly in our work, our embassies throughout, um, or through youth uh, sounding boards, where young people can give their perspectives directly to our local peace and security work. And I know um, we have one of our great partners with us here today, from uh, search for common ground. Lastly, I just want to emphasize that we do see this as an example of an area with the potential for strong uh, transatlantic cooperation. And this is why we at the embassy uh, are so happy to be part of this conversation today here at CSIS. So again, uh, you know, thank you for giving me the floor uh, at this virtual platform. Let me just conclude by saying that by working with young people rather than just for young people and applying the, that principle in our peace and security work, I have no doubt uh, that we will achieve stronger and more long lasting peace. So I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Harold. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with the work with, not just for, uh, and, and you, you talked about youth being equal partners. And, and I think that that's, um, that's may sound easy to, to our audience, but, um, if, if that actually came to fruition, that would be a fundamental change in the way that the international community, uh, views, uh, youth. So thank you again, ambassador. Um, it's an honor to have you here and, and thank you again for all your partnership. Um, I want to turn to our, our panel, and I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Sherizan Minwala, who is joining us from uh, sunny Erbil in, uh, in Iraq. And Sherizan is a, is a lawyer, and she's the chief of party for the U.S. Agency for International Development's Genocide Recovery and Persecution Response Program in Iraq. Hopefully I got that totally right, uh, Sherizan, which is being implemented by uh, MSI, uh, a Tetra Tech company. Sherazan has um, close to two decades uh, of work on rule of law, development, immigration, human rights. Um, she's one of the world's experts in um, sort of gender and, and youth and, and um, the challenges that women and girls are, are facing around the world. Um, and so we're really excited to, to have her here to talk about the work that she is doing in Iraq and maybe even some of the work that she has done uh, elsewhere before. So. Sherazan, I'd love to, to kick this off with you and just hear a little bit about 
maybe your reactions to the ambassador's opening statement or, or just more broadly about how you think about youth peace and security and, and um, sort of the role of youth in promoting peace. Thank you, Errol. Thank you so much to CSIS for putting this together and inviting me to be part of this panel. It's great to um, be with all of you and thank you to the ambassador for your remarks. Um, as you said, I'm uh, uh, representing MSI, which is a Tetra Tech company, and we are implementing youth programs to prevent conflict in several countries, in Bangladesh, in Lebanon, and Indonesia, and in Iraq, where I'm working. Um, and here, uh, as you mentioned, we're working on a genocide recovery and persecution response program, which is a USAID-funded program where we are working with ethnic and religious minority communities that have been targeted by ISIS. Uh, and the program is a gender-based violence program that is testing different pilots. So very sort of innovative programs to address the problem of gender-based violence in these communities. And, and we're talking about violence that was perpetrated by militant extremists, but also violence that exists within these communities. Um, I, I appreciate the remarks uh, and very much agree with the remarks of the ambassador with respect to thinking about how we engage with youth um, to address these issues of conflict and violence. And so, and, and it's the same way that we approach working with women. Um, we're really not there to sort of work for them or to deliver programs to them, but to really engage with them in responding to these problems in their communities. They, bring a lot of innovative ideas. They're very savvy in many ways. There are, are areas where they need to be supported and mentored and really listened to and valued. But you know, there are generational divides and we see that there's a lot that youth have to offer that um, you know, their elders do not. And so what we're doing, and if I could just briefly touch on, on the way that we're addressing these issues in Iraq, um, we're testing five pilot programs and they all, engage with youth in different ways. Um, so for example, and one of the things that we've tried to do because we do focus on women and girls, not exclusively, uh, a number of our, pro uh, part of our programming does engage with men and boys and, and youth, male and female youth in Iraq. But um, we're trying to offer non-traditional programming to women and girls so that they, you know, to really see if they're receptive to, to different kinds of programming. So for example, and this was before COVID, we. Uh, implemented a livelihoods program for girls in Katakosh, which is a community that was targeted by ISIS. Uh, and that involved digital marketing skills, training, photography, and graphic design. Um, and we weren't sure how receptive women would be to that program. There was uh, an overwhelming uh, demand to participate in that program. Another program that we're focusing on is specifically targeting adolescent girls. And one of the issues that we see is um, there's not enough programming that specifically takes age and gender into account and then tailors programs that is age and gender appropriate. So one of the things that we're testing, which is really exciting and we're in the middle of this now, and we're doing it remotely, which is kind of challenging, but also interesting is Taekwondo training for girls. And that is sort of paired with life skills um, programming. And so we found, and it was interesting because families, for example, were kind of hesitant. They thought that this was something for boys. Once we started, our partners started to really sort of explain things and get, get everyone on board and, and, and take the time to sort of listen to them and their concerns, um, there is a lot of interest. And, and now the community is really asking for more. Um, another thing that we're doing, which is really important, is, is really training youth male and female on important skills that they need to deal with um, issues of conflict in their communities, for example, negotiation skills. So one of the pilots that we're testing is on gender sensitive negotiation. And what we're really doing is sort of stepping into customary justice space where tribal and religious leaders tend to resolve conflict and, and problems outside of formal justice systems. And we're training uh, youth on how to resolve problems involving gender-based violence, but from a gender-sensitive perspective. So for example, if a girl wants to go to school, but her father pulled her out of school because he doesn't think that it's important, these negotiators have successfully, in some cases, convinced families to let their daughters go to school. 
Um, and then the, the sort of other um, important area that I'll just touch on is our Women, Peace and Security Agenda uh, program. And what we're doing in all three of our project sites in the Nineveh Plains is to really try to improve access to public space for women and girls. So one of the issues that we see, and especially after conflict, is that they're very isolated. So families are concerned about their safety. They don't necessarily feel comfortable going out into public space. Maybe there's been a lot of destruction. And when people go in and rebuild, they're not thinking about safety and, and accessibility for women and girls. But we're not identifying those spaces. We're working with youth in those communities to ask them, what matters to you? What are your priorities? Do you, do you think you should be renovating these parks? Do, do girls schools need to be improved? One of the communities we work in, for example, there's a lot of work done on boys schools, but not on the girls schools. So taking a very intentional gendered approach to addressing these issues has not only led to improved um, space in public for women and girls, but also strengthening decision-making skills, which is really key for youth um, and then negotiation skills. So they're resolving disputes in their community. So there's a lot of different ways, I think that we're trying to tackle these issues. And I think it very much aligns with the YPS um, agenda, especially thinking about participation, thinking about protection. We do have a legal protection program and then also thinking about prevention. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and I, especially on the prevention, I think we should all be focused on how to not only resolve conflict or violent conflict after it happens, but let's be focused on prevent again in the first place. And I, and I think you, you touched on that. I'm hoping that um, Guadalupe Cruz, who we're gonna go to next, will, will further expand on some of these themes. Um, Guadalupe is, uh, or Lupe, is the director of, of training for Latin America and Central America at an organization called Cure Violence. Um, she has been there for uh, over the last decade and has, has made her way through that organization to now be in, in senior leadership with responsible, responsibility, not only for places like Honduras and Puerto Rico and Mexico, but also, I believe, South Africa, which is really interesting and would love to hear more about that. Um, before she came to Cure Violence, um, Lupe was, spent 20 years working with high-risk youth in some of Chicago's most violent neighborhoods. And so at CSIS, we are primarily a foreign policy-focused think tank, but we actually really love opportunities to talk about what we know from here at home and how it connects um, with, with the work that, that good folks like Lupe are doing overseas. So a similar question to you, Lupe. Thank you again for joining us. How do you think about the role of youth in, in conflict uh, prevention? Well, first, I would like to thank for the invite um, to participate in on this panel. But yes, I um, just want to touch with every what 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 everybody's sharing, and I want to talk a little bit. I want to share a little bit about my experience with cure violence. Um, right now, we're I'm really working. We're working really hard on our expansion and our work in Honduras. Um, we work <clears throat> through a public health approach. Um, we see violence as a public health approach. We work, we, we're working with community leaders and our focus is to work with the high risk individuals. We've partnered up with UNICEF. We also work the gender-based violence, femicide with the young girls and young women, masculine training with the young men in Honduras. Um, some of our challenges have been um, working with the individuals that are the gang leaders, for example. Well, something we're seeing right now in Central America due to the pandemic and the hurricanes. We recently lived in Honduras. The selling, the drug trafficking, the selling of the young girls, for example, in Honduras, we've had mothers go and um, giving up their young daughters at the age of 11 to the gang leaders in exchange for resources, for food or money. Um, that's something we work really hard with the community. <clears throat> I've seen many things in my life 
but um, working in Latin America has changed me and humbled me. Um, we're working in communities where the, there is no resources, there is no um, family control, if that makes any sense. The, the gang leaders control everything you do. Um, they decide your future, your life. Um, police, the corruption on another level. Um, so you cannot call the police. Um, I've seen um, the norm of the young girl being pregnant in Latin America at the age of 12. That's normal. Um, gang rape is a big thing in Latin America not just with young ladies, but with young men. Something we don't talk about in the Hispanic culture is what happens to a man. It's, you just don't talk about it, but it's happening. Young men at the age of 12 or 13 are being raped and <clears throat> their way out of that is suicide. So we see a lot of suicide due to the gang rape. Um, so we've been able to have a reduction due to identifying credible leaders in the community, training them uh, as interrupters, <clears throat> behavior change, norm change, femicide training, gender training, and masculine training. <clears throat> and this is have identifying people from their community to work with the young men and the ladies in their community. For example, I would not be able to save anybody in Honduras. I don't come from their community. But I having um, people, for example, in the United States, most of our interrupters were, have a past of being um, ex-gang members, uh, people that were in prison and came home and changed their life. These people don't exist in Central America. There's only three, three ways, you only have three ways to exit that lifestyle. In the US, you could talk about a retired gang member, an ex-gang member in Latin America. You cannot, these people, you're either gonna have to be put in a church where they could fully monitor you because they feel you have, you carry a lot of information. You're gonna be killed or you have to leave the country with your family. And they give you a certain amount of time to exit the country with your family. That's why when we hear about people uh, from Honduras, Latin America, trying to come to the U.S. because their life at, is at risk, it's true. I've seen it, I've been there, and I've seen families totally murdered because they did not leave on time. Um, so working with these young ladies and these young men at a very young age on that behavior change and that norm change into be able to talk about their feelings, which they it's not normal to do in Latin America, is very crucial to be able to understand that what we live, we've normalized, if that makes any sense, but it's not normal. In our culture, we've normalized it. Um, and I could share some stories that we've had recently. You know, we've lived... Uh, Hurricane Ota and Hurricane Eta I was there during the second hurricane and everybody went to shelters. A shelter is a school with no plumbing, no, no running water, um, no food. And we had families that were, you know, separated. Our, our team worked really hard on identifying the families or reuniting families with their young daughters because the gangs were identifying the young girls in the shelters and taking them or raping them. Um, it was tragic. We had people living on the carreteras, on the streets, the main streets. Um, the hurricane has hit our poorest communities. Uh, the cemetery, I went into a community where the cemetery came up, we are floating, the dead bodies floating all through the community with the young girls and young men there. Um, and they, they didn't respond like it wasn't normal. I don't really don't know how to explain how, you know, they've normalized the way they live. It was okay. When yeah, they're, they're sort of used to seeing tragedy, you know, in a way. They are. And it's not normal. Again, 
being able, we've had in Honduras, we've had a 62% reduction in the communities that we work in. Um, we were, when we started working in Honduras, we were, they were in competition with Juarez to be the most violent countries in the world. Right. And coming from working in Chicago all my life, thinking I've seen it all, it was a whole other ball game when I arrived to Honduras and Juarez. For example, Juarez is again, another, there you're dealing with cartel. A cartel that used the young ladies to traffic their, their drugs. That have the young boys at the age of 10 on the corner um, to identify who's coming in the community. And their job is to notify the cartel leader. And this is how our children, our young girls and our young ladies are being utilized in these communities okay. and being able to have access to these young ladies and young men and working with them with education, working with them with family resources, connecting them um, to psychological, psychiatrists, um, therapy. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. working. You know, yeah. I, it's, uh, I, I think that's all really important. And, and thank you for painting, painting such a, a vivid picture. I think it, it's useful to really ground this discussion and in, in some of the challenges that young people are facing. Um, uh, Lupe, I, I will want to come back to you a little bit in, in a little bit to talk about, you know, when, once you identify those leaders, um, what are the types of things that you want to talk to them about to get them to actually reduce the violence. I mean, the three ways out, either you're protected in a church, you're killed, or you leave the country is not really offering young people a whole lot of way forward. And so I, I want to go to Rachel next, Lupe, but maybe I'll come back to you in a little bit um, about that, because I'd love to dig in a little bit. Um, Rachel Walsh-Taza is a, is a program manager for Search for Common Grounds uh, Children and Youth Division. Um, she has worked around uh, youth peace and security. She's sort of the search's uh, global focal point, if I can say it that way, uh, around youth peace and security. And she's at the <clears throat> sort of intersection of program implementation and, and research. Um, I, I'm hoping that she'll talk about at some point uh, her really important work that, that they did in partnership with the, the United Network of Young Peace Builders. Um, where she led a, a global survey of almost uh, 400 youth-led groups working on peace and security around the world. Um, and a quick plug for that final report, which was really excellent. It's called the Missing Peace Independent Progress Study on Youth Peace and Security. So Rachel, I would love your thoughts on anything you've heard here, um, but also generally just how you think about youth peace and security. Sure, and thank you for that introduction. Really great to be part of this discussion today. Um, so I think, you know, what we're hearing from Lupe and Sherazan really reinforces what we know about the roles that young people play in peace and security. And, and search when we work with young people, it's based on the recognition that first of all, young people are heavily affected by conflict. One in four young people around the world are affected by violence or armed conflict. And they are, and, and Lupe described some of those really gut-wrenching impacts that they face as a result of violence. Um, the other is that they influence the way that conflict unfolds today. They're not promises for the future. They, they have the innate skills, abilities, and reach to really make a difference on some of those root causes of violence. Um, and, and conflict issues that they experience in their communities. I think something else that came out across what Lupe and Sherazan were both talking about are some of the barriers that young people face and peace and security. And these were reinforced in both that study of youth-led peace groups, um, which we conducted with the United Network of Young Peace Builders um, and contributed to um, what Errol referred to, a global independent progress study on youth peace and security um, which was supported by the Peace Building Support Office um, and the UNFPA um, under the Global Coalition on Youth Peace and Security, which I encourage everyone to read. Um, but what those barriers are that young people point to are three key barriers. One, 
are the norms and stereotypes around young people and peace and security. And some of those are, you know, they're, they're very gendered. There is this idea that young men um, are violent and um, need to be contained. There is the idea of young women being passive victims who need to be protected, which is reflected in a lot of the comments that um, both Sherazan and Lupe made about the um, local context where they work. And what happens is, I, I mean, this also, this goes into a whole set of stereotypes around young people who don't have access to education or who are unemployed or underemployed also being kind of ticking time bombs who might set off into violence at any time. But what evidence and what research indicates is the vast majority of young people are peaceful. And many of them choose peace by fleeing, like what Lupe was saying. You know, if your, your choice is either to participate in violence or to flee, flight and migration is often the choice to remain peaceful. Um, what we also find is many young people internalize these stereotypes and it ends up affecting how they view themselves and other people, other young people's roles in peace and security. Um, what we also see is many of these stereotypes are then reflected in policies towards young people, which means that rather than recognizing the positive role that young people can play and the peaceful nature and resilient nature of the vast majority of young people, they focus on the violent minority. And that leads to widespread securitized approaches that end up being counterproductive, further excluding and marginalizing many young people. Before I say more about that, I'll quickly jump to the two other barriers because um, I want to hear more from the other speakers. Another key barrier is the safety, the lack of safety that young people face. So there is um, not only the risks that they face from armed and violent groups in their communities, they're, one of the biggest risks they face is repression by governments. And um, evidence indicates that governments facing large youth populations preemptively repress, tend to preemptively repress legitimate and peaceful avenues for youth expression out of this fear of a dangerous youth bulge. And um, in what we found in these studies are, is really interesting. In many cases, young peace builders are more afraid of their government or security forces than they are of the violent and armed groups. And so there is this enormous need for greater protection of young people and young peace builders. The third barrier um, that came out in these studies is around the operational constraints that young people face. And we see that around a third of the youth-led peace groups that we interviewed operate on less than $1,000 a year, 50% of them on less than $5,000 a year. 97% of their members are volunteers. And that has really clear implications for what they're able to accomplish, how well they're able to document their work, how well they're able to scale. Um, Another key barrier they face is in registration. Um, in a study we did in Colombia, we found that some, I think we documented something like 300 plus youth groups there, 47% of them were unregistered. And all of that kind of connects back to that challenge around the stereotypes and norms where young people, youth-led organizations have difficulty registering. That translates into a real difficulty accessing funding and support for their work. Um, and I'll just close briefly by saying um, how SEARCH works on these issues. So SEARCH is the largest peace building, largest dedicated peace building organization in the world. Um, and we work with young people both at a local level to prevent violence and address some of the root causes to violence in places like Yemen, Sudan and South Sudan, um, Afghanistan more recently. We're in over 30 countries across Africa, Asia, Middle East, and North Africa, and um, smaller presences in Europe and the US. And young people are key partners in most of that work. Secondary level, uh, we also work at the international level because we find it so important to shift those norms around young people, to influence policy and practice to make it so that young people really have this role in peace and security. And just as the ambassador mentioned, um, one of those critical landmark um, shifts was UN Security Council Resolution 2250, which search as um, a founding co-leader of this global coalition on youth peace and security helped advocate for, and then followed that up with advocacy for subsequent UN Security Council resolutions that specifically recognize um, number one, 
peace processes, uh, one of the formal spaces that is the most exclu exclusive for young people, and protection as being a key area of need, both of which topics we're working on with the Global Coalition on Youth Peace and Security. And this real need to then operationalize all of those international frameworks on national, regional, multilateral levels. And so the introduction of the USYPS Act in the US recently, we really aimed for that to address many of the barriers that we discuss. Happy to discuss more in here from our other speakers. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Uh, there was a lot there. And um, I knew I made a good decision when I asked you to come speak, because I think that was a much better kind of grounding of what we heard into, into key takeaways. And so I hope uh, everyone in the audience was was paying close attention because there was a lot there. Um, we are starting to get audience questions and I'll turn to those um, in a second. It's uh, for those that are listening, please feel free to, to continue sending in questions. Sherazan, I wanna turn to you um, both just for general thoughts about what you've heard uh, after you had an opportunity to speak, but also I, I would love for you and Lupe to, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what is, what's the role of youth in post-COVID recovery. You know, in our, in our paper, we talked about entrepreneurship. We talked about, um, you know, maybe in a world where we're all on Zoom, youth are actually better positioned to be engines of economic growth and stability. And, um, you know, as Lupe and, and Sherazan mentioned, miles to go before we even get to a baseline level of decency um, and, and stability for, for young people. But have you thought a any about what the role of youth can be um, moving forward in post-COVID. So Sherazan, maybe we start with you and then Lupe, I'd love your thoughts on that as well. Thank you. And, and if it's okay, just before I jump into the COVID piece, I just wanna to respond to um, the really powerful um, um, examples that Lupe gave of, of the work that you're doing in Honduras and also that you've done in Chicago. I, I also have practiced immigration and asylum law. And so I know um, how challenging that work is, but I think you really illustrated just, you know, the, the, the horror of what people go through and how they end up being so trapped. And, and, and those stories don't really come out and they need to because people don't really understand what the context is. And so I know that's really difficult work. I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I also wanted to acknowledge just you know, how much violence, which really goes to um, Rachel's study also, how much violence plays a role in presenting a barrier for so many people and how it has such a negative impact. But there was something that you said, Rachel, that was so interesting that really resonated with me. And that was about just the gendered stereotypes that people often have of, of male and female youth. And so just to give an example, because I've done a lot of work with the Yazidi community and for those who aren't familiar with what happened, there was a genocide committed by ISIS against the Yazidi community. And thousands of women and girls were abducted and enslaved and subjected to brutal sexual violence. And what was very interesting to me was that when they came out of captivity, the only story that was told about them was one of passive victimhood. And I, you know, when you talk to those women, that is absolutely not the full story. And so, you know, if you listen to them, you hear stories of real courage and bravery that they showed when they were in captivity, when they decided to escape, and then when they came back and faced their community, which historically would have completely rejected them, but decided to accept them back this time. And so I think if people would look at, and, and one other piece to that is really the children. There are children that have been born of war that are being called terrorist babies. And so, you know, if we change the way that we think about individuals, we'll change the way that we respond to them and the way that they internalize all of that shame and stigma that really gets put on them. Um, and, and sort of really recognize that there's something else going on here. And they have a lot to offer in terms of how they struggle um, in the face of that violence as part of their recovery. So I just wanted to acknowledge that because I thought that was really powerful. And also the piece that you noted about repression, because we've seen that in Iraq, as you mentioned, um, young people getting out there and saying, we're not okay with the corruption. We want jobs, we want opportunities. We don't want the same old thing, the same thing that got us into this situation in the first place. And they're sacrificing their lives and people have been killed for doing that. So really brave, courageous youth who are out there um, demanding a better country. Um, in response to your question, Errol, about COVID, you know, it's interesting. I think we're already seeing a lot that's going on. 
with youth, and I mean, I know every country is different in the way that they've responded to COVID and the way that COVID has impacted their communities. Um, in Iraq, it's a very communal society. And so uh, COVID, um, I think, spread through many families. The numbers here are very low now, but a lot of the community also didn't quite take it that seriously. And so in some ways, you know, we had the lockdowns, we had the curfews, but we also had life sort of going on as normal. Um, but we as, as programmers have had to take that into consideration. And so it's kind of interesting because we've had to, to develop remote programs to ensure that we're not putting people at risk. Some of our programs are done in person because when you need to go to court, you need to be there in person. But um, just for example, you know, the adolescent programming, I mean, people are really wanting to be able to get out and meet in person and engage with their community. And, and I think they just have so much to offer. There's a lot of enthusiasm and there's a lot of eagerness. People don't want to be sitting at home. Young people, you know, in a lot of these communities, they're, they're bored and they feel like there's the opportunities aren't there and they can't always make them and create them themselves for some of the reasons that I think Rachel was pointing to, that it's not always easy to sort of establish their presence, establish an organization, get funding resources. And so setting up these programs that really offers those opportunities, I think we find that there's just a, a great willingness and eagerness to do something. Um, and so I, what I think is also really interesting is, is just really listening to young people about what they think is needed in their communities, um, what would be effective, how do we go about responding to these issues. Um, for them, like so many of them have suffered around the world in terms of lack of access to education. A lot of them have been isolated. Um, you know, there's a lot of mental health issues, some, sometimes worse in some areas than others. We know gender-based violence is a big problem. We've continued to offer services for women and girls who are facing gender-based violence, but it's not easy and it's done sometimes remotely. And, and so you have to really alter how you do that work. Uh, but I think it's just super important that while the pandemic is continuing, that we keep finding ways to engage with these communities. And then post-pandemic, you know, make that transition, figure out what is needed to help people sort of like, like we, we're not just going back to normal. Things have happened. People have struggled. Um, people have lost relatives, you know, like whatever it is, people have lost their education. So really supporting them to sort of overcome what has been lost and then find a, a path forward. Thanks for that. Uh, Lupe, can I turn to you on this um, a little bit more of a, a COVID question? Yes, and in Latin America, we had to adapt our work to working during the pandemic. And uh, we've seen, we've identified that the changes, we're identifying more family violence, more child violence, more abuse in the homes, where families that um, live in a, a one bedroom house, a family of 10, uh, usually had the doors open, the fathers usually never home. Um, most of the time they spend outside. Now they're they were locked in. Um, we've identified um, a lot of abuse by the fathers with the young ladies. We've had some young girls pregnant by their own family members. Um, so we had to adapt to different type of violence not just uh, street violence and uh, training to be able to help our young men and our young ladies. Um, the mothers, again, I shared that story, you know, with the pandemic, no resources in the community. There's no jobs. Um, practicing social distance has been a challenge. I really believe that our data in Latin America is not up to date. Um, families don't have resources to go get tested. Uh, families are living a norm, like if nothing's going on. Something we hear a lot about is they'll put on a mask if they go into a store because it's mandated. But as soon as they walk out of the store, they take off the mask and they go on like a regular day. We've had many families affected um, with the COVID. 
a lot of lo lives lost in one of our communities, our low income communities, the government was dropping off bodies in their um, cornfields. Um, COVID just coming in and dropping off bodies to be, you know, like nothing. Uh, I could share that the gang leaders, which are people, which they, that they stepped up for the community, that they, they put, um, it wasn't acceptable what they were doing in their communities. And the gang leaders put a wall against the police and the government dropping off bodies in our communities. Um, we've had stories where family members were deceased due to the COVID and they wouldn't pick up the body for three or four days. Um, so we've had some horrific stories, um, but we part of the work we do is the PPE. Uh, we work hard with um, the mask, providing masks, hand sanitizer, soap, um, activities for the kids to do at home. For example, coloring books and crayons. I know to us, they seem like something small. They're very big things in Latin America. Parents cannot afford a box of crayons. But being able pro to provide board games that they could stay at home instead of being in the street, um, in the stores, putting the X's on the floor six feet apart uh, where they could stand six feet apart. The pub ed campaigns um, were very big on the camp pub ed campaigns due to the COVID. Um, we've seen something that was very interesting and I would like to share is that we had a couple stories of in Latin America where the gang leaders mandated their groups to wear masks. And that came from the high risk individuals. They, as part of their gang rules right now, is they must wear a mask at all times due to the pandemic. And I thought that was, you know, one of the gang leaders told me, you know what, Lupe, we're human beings too. And we have parents, we have sisters, we have brothers, and I have kids, he told me. And I do not want to see my kids die this way. You know, we worked with him for many years. He's been, I've seen him change. I, I don't know how to say, share his story, but. <clears throat> Leadership comes from really unexpected places sometimes. It does. He's, he shared a story with me that stood with me. He <clears throat> participated in a gender, in a gender training and he got into, he told me, you know, I'm separated from my wife. And I said, okay, are you doing good? He said, I just want to share something. He said, you know, if I wouldn't have learned the things I've learned now, he said, she'd probably be buried right now. He goes, but I took it upon me to walk away because I don't want to see my daughters um, grow up seeing their mother being beaten. He said, I walked away and she got abusive with me, he told me. He said, when she seen I wasn't responding the way I usually responded, which was violent me, he said, she started getting abusive with me, thinking that she was, you know, he said, and he put his hand up at her and he put it, he said, and I thought about what I've learned. He said, and I put my hand down and I grabbed my stuff and I walked out of the house. He said, I'm taking care of my daughters, he said but I didn't kill her. And that stood with me, you know, because- well, it's probably related very much to the training that, that Cure Violence and, and other groups have done. L Lupe, if, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to get to a couple of our audience questions. Um, I think these, um, you know, you're bringing up a, a lot of really important issues. And, and I keep thinking about how leadership comes from unexpected places and, um, the other thing I was thinking about is, you know, you mentioned um, children 10 years old, 12 years old, um, sort of having difficulties here. And, and there's actually an audience question from, um, from Ezekiel from Creative Associates that says, what role, and I, I'd love to go to Rachel for this, if I can, 
um, what role can early childhood education play in setting youth on the path to preventing violence? Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of sort of interesting conversation here um, uh, about um, the challenges that youth face. Uh, we're not talking about teenagers sometimes, we're talking about kids, um, young kids. And so in particular, can the integration of, of social emotional learning methods in upper elementary curriculum help to counteract violence and conflict? So pretty specific on that second part, but gen generally talk about the um, early childhood education. Sure, yep, and um, I'll refer back to, again, this incredible study which SEARCH contributed to, but just to be clear, it was um, led by technical experts from Interpeace. Um, so a, a really big um, area of focus within the study was actually on education for a number of reasons. First of all, education is often a site of conflict. Of course, it's a place of resilience, but it's also a site of conflict. Um, and what we can find there is this may be where conflict parties um, try to inject their own narratives of history, or we will see exclusion of certain marginalized populations reinforced and reproduced within education. It's also the first site where most young people interact directly with the state. And um, this leads to uh, education being a really, really critical part of resilience and ability to navigate conflict as young people grow up. In fact, it was one of the areas of greatest hope that young people around the world expressed was on the positive power that education could have for transforming those relationships between young people and the conflict they experience, which I think social emotional learning can be really important for their resilience. Um, it, it can form a really important part of a lot of the psychosocial support interventions that are critical in, within conflict affected areas. Um, also, you know, as part of that, a really important role that can be played is facilitating those interactions, experiential learning, collaboration between young people across divides. Even at a very early age, we have a program in Lebanon that worked with, um, I think they were under, I think they were eight and above. I'm now blanking on the exact age range, but um, they were very young. And the idea was that they would come for this English language class. That's why they were motivated to come. And it would bring together Syrian refugees, Palestinian refugees, and Lebanese um, residents together to study English. And what we actually found is by bringing these children together, not only did it address some of the um, you know, stereotypes and assumptions that they had already absorbed at such a young age, such a young age, um, but also it brought their parents together. So there are also these um, kind of um, reflections that can go beyond just the young people who are engaging. And for this, I, I would, the only thing I would add is that beyond social emotional learning, which is really, really important for young people, um, there needs to be this complementary work on the system of education and whether that is reinforcing conflict or addressing it. Um, and it again gets to the role of what are young people's role in education? Are they having some kind of say over curriculum? Are they, um, you know, are we reinforcing the same exclusion that we see for young people in society within education? And that's why we work on things like peace clubs that deal with issues between a school's administration and young people within the school or in school and out of school students. So anyway, those are some very general ideas about the really important role that education can play in peace building. Well, I love what you said there though. I mean, it's sort of like focus on the micro, focus on the children, but also don't forget about the macro, the systems. Um, and, and I think that's um, a really excellent point. I also can't help but think throughout this whole conversation about you know, teenage Errol and how socially and emotionally unprepared I was for a relatively privileged life. And if you had infused all of the other types of challenges that Sherazan and Lupe are talking about, how just utterly unprepared I would have been uh, in my teenage years, much less my pre-adolescent years. So, um, you know, I, I think the challenges are very real and I'm sure the audience is feeling that as well. Um, Sherazan and, and Lupe, if I could come back to you, there's another question um, 
this time from Nick, who is a member of the UK Armed Forces. And Nick wants to know about uh, the, the role of sports and, and leadership skills, uh, team membership, feeling a part of something um, as an effective tool to generate social change. So um, we've got some other questions that I'd love to get to, but if I could get your quick reactions on that um, sports and leadership, uh, that'd, be, that'd be great. Sure, yeah, I can jump in quickly. I just, I'll, I'll quickly point to sort of two things that we're doing now that um, I think really respond to that. One is, you know, I'm going back to the Taekwondo training. And, and one of the reasons we really included this in our programming for girls is that, you know, there, there's a lot of different aspects to engaging in um, like martial arts training that include like building character, building confidence, building mental discipline, physical discipline, and strength. And so there's all these sort of different components that are things that girls, I think, are often deprived of in, in a community like Iraq. I mean, girls, like, for example, when they start to hit um, adolescence or even younger, sometimes they're told they shouldn't ride a bike because they might fall off and break their hymen, and that's going to be a problem for them. So, you know, to, to, to give girls confidence in their bodies, both physically and mentally, I think is a really powerful thing. And another thing I'll just point to as part of our Women, Peace and Security program, one of the things that, so like I said, these are youth led initiatives. And one of the things that a girl in one of our programs came up with, which was really interesting, I, I forget how old she was. I don't think she was a teenager, but anyway, um, was, was to sort of have a bike campaign. And so they got a bunch of youth together because girls don't normally ride and, and, and female youth don't normally ride bikes in public in a community that has gone through what they had been through, displaced by ISIS. And so not only did they sort of have a very public bike riding exercise, but they also learned how to fix bikes and, you know, use tools and things that are typically done by men. And, um, and I think they found that very empowering. You know, and you want, and, and what we're seeing is that if you give these young women opportunities, they will take them. Um, I think a lot of people assume that they don't want to do those kinds of things, but that, that's not what we're seeing. And so it really like to be able to build your confidence and say, I can do the same thing a boy can do or a man can do, you know, and prove it. Um, it, it we see it happening in other countries. There's no reason why it can't happen in the places that we work. And so like, you know, not everyone will be interested, but there, there's always somebody. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it, it makes them feel better about themselves and makes them feel like they can do things that um, they might have thought otherwise that they couldn't. Thanks uh, for, for that. Lupe, um, I want to get to one more question. I think I'm going to pose to Rachel, but any thoughts, Lupe, on this um, the sports and leadership training? It sounds like so much of the work that you're doing at the community level is about identifying these leaders, unorthodox though they may be, uh, and giving them the skills. Is there a sports aspect to this? There is, and I just wanna share, I agree with a lot that shares and share. We do work um, in, internationally. Soccer is a big activity in our communities. So we now have the girls soccer teams, which at one time they had them, but they weren't really accepted. Um, so we do work with the sports, the soccer. Um, we have a couple teams with girls included with the male soccer players. They're just as good. I mean, some of them are even better, I think. <laughs> but yes, it's a big, we play a big role with that. Excellent. Um, thank you for that. I, uh, Rachel, I'm going to come back to you for a last question. Um, there are a couple audience questions that we didn't get to, and I apologize to the audience um, for that. I before I ask Rachel this question, Sherazan and, and Lupe, I'm gonna go last word to you. If there's a tweet length final takeaway that you want the audience to leave this conversation with, you know, just one sentence, what's the one sentence version of this event that you want people to go home with? So Sherazan and Lupe, last word will be to you. But Rachel, if I could go to you first, and, and um, the question is from Barbara from American University. Can you please explain ways governments preemptively repress other avenues for youth to stay out of violent gangs uh, or prevent them from participating in, in peace building? So sort of the role of government in this. Sure. And it's a, it's a 
kind of complex relationship between repressing young people's legitimate political action and their involvement in violent gangs. So um, what tends to happen is that uh, one of the ways that young people really work for peace is through political protest or peaceful or non-political protest. And what happens is those, the freedoms of association of speech are very often curtailed in many of these countries that are facing large youth populations and some sort of violent conflict. Um, and by curtailing them and cracking down kind of wide swaths um, really, you know, like deciding a neighborhood of people, an entire neighborhood of people are at risk for violence and responding to the violent minority by actually targeting a huge swath of young people ends up being counterproductive because then what it teaches these young people is whether or not you participate in violence, you're going to be, um, you know, frisked, uh, harassed, arrested. And what happens is these young people then become more scared of their security forces than their own, than the violent gangs in their neighborhoods. Um, and in some cases, you know, a violent gang may end up providing protection from government repression. So it's like a, a slightly complicated relationship. And of course, the actual number of young people who are participating or supporting violence are a vast minority. Um, and then I, so I think, you know, like one of the best ways we can think about responding to this is how do we shift all of those resources and investments that go towards countering violent extremism, counterterrorism that really focus on the securitized response? How do we shift those to focus on prevention, positive resilience, recognizing the positive work that young people are doing for peace and security and getting more resources and support to that? And um, you know, before I close, I just wanted to share, there's a really excellent report we've been working on with MSI for USAID on um, positive youth development in the Middle East and North Africa that outlines a lot of great best practices about how we really support that preventive um, approach and resilience of young people. Excellent, uh, really look forward to, to reading that. So Lupe, uh, let me come to you on your final sentence takeaway and then I'll give the last word to Sherazan. Lupe? I would like everyone to just take away that our young men and our young ladies are people, human beings that are going through different challenges. Um, I always share with everyone, we need to give them their identity back and not, I, not target them identify them as the, the high risk, the bad, because they all have a story. They have a story. And when you hear their stories, you understand why they are who they are. So just. Excellent. Thank you. Sherazan, last word to you. I, I would just say that, um, you know, in my experience, young people suffer a lot from decisions that are made by older generations that lead to conflict and violence. But I think young people are natural um, champions for peace. And given the opportunity, they can really bring about positive change. On that note, thank you to everyone that tuned in. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Lupe. Thank you, Sherazan. Thank you thank to you. the ambassador of Denmark. Um, this has been a really, really inspiring, challenging, uh, conversation, and, and I hope we can do it again soon. So thank you again to everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.